Hello everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead. I know it's been a couple of weeks now since I did a show. Uh, the reason for that, as those of you who follow The Bridgehead on social media will have noticed, is I was in Ireland with two of my colleagues from the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, uh, as well as my wife and infant daughter. And we were essentially there to try and help the pro-life organizations on the ground in whatever way we could leading up to the referendum on the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution. So most of you will have, have read all about this uh, by this time because this is sort of old news. But just to encapsulate very briefly, uh, the Irish Prime Minister, who happens to be good friends with the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Leo Varadkar, uh, who ran on an explicitly pro-life platform as a pro-life doctor and medical professional, no less, as well as the health minister, Simon Harris, who also ran as a pro-lifer and actually sent an email uh, while he was campaigning for office to the pro-life groups promising that he was pro-life, flipped and declared that they would like to launch a referendum on the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution, which essentially uh, affirms the right to life of the unborn child. And if that uh, referendum would successfully overturn the Eighth Amendment, it would give the Irish government the ability to legislate abortion on demand. And they essentially promised that abortion would be legalized up to 12 weeks, that in, in many cases, for the very vague reason of mental health, that abortion would be uh, permitted up to six months. and. In addition to that, they didn't even have conscious protections for those physicians who oppose abortion, which if uh, any of you were keeping an eye on the campaign, there were thousands upon thousands of medical professionals who were very opposed to bringing abortion into Ireland. Now, the difficulty uh, with this campaign, of course, is that Ireland has become increasingly liberal uh, over the past several decades. They brought in both divorce and gay marriage by referendum. Uh, but a lot of people were hoping that pro-life Ireland will would have survived the destruction of the old order because Ireland had really achieved something very exceptional and it was that exact reason that Ireland was so hated and so despised by the elites, by the European Union, by the United Nations, uh, by the international abortion industry and of course by abortion activists themselves. And that was because Ireland, even though it protected the life of the preborn child in the womb, had essentially proven that the idea that abortion as healthcare was a lie. Uh, so essentially, the World Health Organization itself said that, that Ireland is one of the safest places to be pregnant and to have a baby. Their maternal mortality index was far better than countries where abortion has been legal uh, for a very long time. And in order to persuade people that keeping abortion illegal hurt women, the yes side of the repeal campaign had to lie to the Irish public consistently by claiming that the case of Savita was as the result of the fact that she was denied an abortion. In reality, Savita did not die because she was denied an abortion. Three official investigations into her death confirmed over and over and over again that she died from sepsis, and the investigations found that the doctors missed 13 separate opportunities uh, for treatment that could have saved her life. Some were charged with malpractice. That being said, uh, the crowds at Dublin Castle after the abortion activists prevailed last week Friday uh, were not only cheering and howling and crying in, in joy and in glee that they had the right now to end the lives of their preborn children, they also were chanting her name. Uh, her face was all over the Irish Times and other newspapers, and her face was actually up on signs all around Dublin and even scattered throughout the countryside. I'm not going to pretend that the results on Friday, where the Irish voted over 60% to repeal the abortion law, um, wasn't heartbreaking. We, we thought there was going to be more pro-lifers. I still can't figure out exactly why so much of the polling data was wrong on this. Um, the only thing that I can think of is the fact that uh, approximately 40% of the population did not vote in this referendum. Many of the no voters were older voters, and so perhaps they just didn't come out to vote. And perhaps a lot of them were complacent and just believed that things couldn't change and that, uh, that Ireland would never truly do away explicitly with the right to life for preborn children and become the first country to bring in abortion on demand by popular demand. Um, but nevertheless, here we are. It was, it was especially heartbreaking because we had the opportunity over the last several weeks to work with these wonderful Irish pro-lifers. I often say that as somebody who works full-time in the pro-life movement, I get to meet the best people because I land in a country and then immediately get to work with people who are willing to sacrifice everything uh, for other people's babies, for other people. 
Uh, I met one guy in Mullingar who had sold his car dealership and was living off his savings for six months while he went door to door trying to convince people to work pro-life. I met uh, Tim Jackson who had quit his job just to work full time for the Save the Eighth campaign and, and convince the Irish to vote against abortion. I met people who were skipping university classes and skipping university assignments to go on the Vote No Roadshow right across rural Ireland and some of the, the, the bigger cities to, to advocate for a no vote. I met moms who, who came out with the babies strapped to them who were doing everything they could to protect babies like the ones that they loved so much. Uh, these people were just phenomenal and, and they're so joyful and so happy and that's in such contrast to the anger and the bitterness of the other side. Uh, there is something that is joyful and happy about fighting for the good and the true and the beautiful. Uh, I had my daughter Charlotte strapped to my back as I was going door to door um, dropping leaflets and mailboxes in Dublin. The mailing companies uh, mailed out all the yes pamphlets but then suddenly claimed that the pro-lifers had missed some sort of deadline and we ended up with 120,000 leaflets that we had to try and get out by hand. So we were going door to door and one guy came out to explain why he was voting yes and he was very angry and my daughter peered at him uh, <laughs> and he said that's not fair. And I found that to be such an interesting response that his conscience still afflicted him when a baby peered at him while he justified the idea that killing babies that are not all that much younger than her is okay. And so this w was a really heartbreaking response. I've been in touch with a, a lot of our, our new Irish friends and, and they are heartbroken and it is heartbreaking to consider the fact that the abortion regimes that we've lived with in Canada and the United States will now be brought to a country that has never, well they haven't had legalized child killing on the island since the days of St. Patrick when human sacrifice happened with the pagan Irish to satisfy the fertility gods. It's, it's, been, it's been that long uh, and, and they've had such a culture of life and they still do have, have a culture of life that I know they take for granted because things are so much worse than they used to be but uh, coming from a Canadian or an American perspective over a third of their population voted to keep abortion entirely illegal in the country and many people voted just for exceptions. So now it's time to go street to street, door to door and rebuilding uh, pro-life Ireland. Uh, when there was a, a referendum in, in Italy uh, a couple of decades ago and 32% of the people voted for something, uh, one of the headlines the following day was, let us start with 32. And I think this very much applies also to the example of Ireland. And one of the things a lot of people haven't noticed actually is that uh, abortion is still illegal in Northern Ireland. Uh, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland are still two separate countries. And uh, a lot of the Northern Irish crossed the border, which is a soft border. You can drive, you, you have to peer pretty closely at the signs to notice that you're, you're entering into a different country. And that's as a result of the 1998 Good Friday Agreement that ended the troubles. Uh, but anyways, I digress. Um, it's still illegal there. And now, of course, there's heavy pressure on those politicians to legalize abortion there. Uh, and I, I had a conversation with Bernadette Smith of Precious Life. I met her a couple of years ago at an international pro-life conference in the United States. Um, she's been a hardcore pro-life activist for years and years and I also met her briefly in the Republic of Ireland um, when we were on the Vote No Road show. She had come out to, to help her compatriots uh, on, on the south side of the border. And so I, I wanted to know what was going on in Northern Ireland in, in the wake of this referendum and so I gave her a call uh, and this is our conversation. Um, as you know, Northern Ireland is well part of the UK, um, um, and we're the only part of the UK where abortion is illegal. Even though we're Northern Ireland, but we have a separate government, and the government here is um, so far uh, being pro-life and has continued to oppose any um, introduction of abortion here um, since 1967, when abortion was introduced into the UK. So uh, we do have a very strong government. But um, the influence of the media, the sad cases, uh, you know, the tragedy of women who um, having to travel to England, um, I'm saying this is the way the media are, are portraying it. These poor women have to travel, they've had a diagnosis or, um, that their child has a life limited disability. So it's really what's happening at the moment is the same that start that happened in Ireland. Right. Um, Tomorrow in Ireland, um, we have the start of the illegal abortion uh, pill bus. You know, it's like a, they started in Ireland, maybe, I don't know where it was last year or the year before, um, and they're coming in with their abortion pills to try to break the law, um, to try to, you know, to find a way um, to break the law, to change the law. 
Um, so we're just seeing the same tactics. So what we're doing at the moment, I suppose, is monitoring what's actually happening, um, how the uh, the pro-abortion movement are, what way they're planning to try to raise uh, the issue here. The media are dancing, opening every door. They're they're dancing to the chin of the pro-abortion movement. It hasn't been off the news here um, since Friday. Really. Um, and today it's it's been carried on the news tomorrow. I'll be doing interviews with like Channel Four. There's a lot of English channels um, tuning in uh, to what's happening here and the pressure, as you know, I'm sure you've read, uh, with the British Prime Minister Theresa May is to um, to impose abortion uh, into Northern Ireland to bypass the democratic process at Stormont. Uh, because Stormont is uh, collapsed at the moment or for the last year and a half. We don't have a government, but we have devolution and abortion um, comes under uh, the criminal law. In 2010, the uh, British government devolved the issue of policing and justice. So abortion is a justice issue and we have rights here. Um, through the democratic process, and the only way we can change the law can be changed here is by um, a vote at uh, Stormont by our elected representatives. Unlike the Irish Republic, where the, uh, unfortunately um, and sadly the people decided to change the law um, to destroy their own Irish children, here we have a democracy, but we're under threat from uh, Westminster by um, Labour government and the Conservative government who, um, who are calling for an amendment to, put to, uh, to be put forward to a bill uh, in the next couple of weeks. And that uh, they're hoping that it could be debated and a, a vote taken to extend abortion. But the Prime Minister is holding back because she needs um, the Democratic Unionist Party, the 10 members who are propping her government up at this time. Right. Does that hold up? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Theresa May is obviously very pro-abortion. She tweeted out congratulations yeah. to the Republic yeah. of Ireland after the results. Of, uh, uh, so is the only reason she won't force abortion on Northern Ireland because of the DUP members that she needs to prop up her government? Yeah, yeah that and also um, because the government here is a very sensitive issue here. Even even the Sinn Féin party who are, who are pro-abortion um, and have... Um, campaign for the yes vote in the Republic of Ireland, and they are an all-Ireland party, they're not in favour of a British style of abortion. They want an Irish style of abortion, if you get what I'm saying right. in quotes. Yeah, they're saying, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, extend it or imposed by Britain, but we want the same rights for women, so-called right. rights for women in the North. So she'll, she'll very clearly be understanding that not only is the Democratic Unionist Party pro-life, and yes, she depends on them. They propped her government up. She needs them. And, and if she was to unsettle that, that would unsettle her position as a prime minister. So and it's, she's a piggy in the middle at the, at, at the minute because she's been pressurized by her own party. Like, it's time to extend this act. You know, and the media have been like really like so vocal, as we know all over the world, the capabilities of the media and how they set the, the ground for laws and they start promoting the hard cases. And she... Um, She's been very, very quiet about it, but I, I didn't realize she was as pro-abortionist what she actually is until I read that tweet as well. But I think what she's doing there, she's playing a click, she's playing it cleverly because she's making out that, yeah, I agree with that, but we uh, have a devolved uh, government at Stormont. They must decide. Now, it's even some of her own, you know, um, second in command, I, I'm not sure, he is pro-life, Jack up something or the other. Uh, remember Jacob, his name? Jacob Rees Mogg. Yeah, that's your guy. He was speaking yesterday and um, he clearly outlined that this is a matter for the Northern Ireland Assembly. And it, it's like every, the, the Democratic Unionist Party have made their views known. It is not for, for Westminster to legislate. Um, at the moment, there is a, a process of talks still carrying on behind the scenes. Um, Sinn Féin and DUP need to be working together to get the executive and the uh, government up and running. So I suppose Theresa May and some of the other more experienced um, MPs would know that it's, it would be insensitive. It would be could be a constitutional crisis for Westminster if Theresa May was to come out and say, well, this is an issue we need to vote on or I agree with that because it would cause chaos um, for her. 
but it also would cause um, a constitutional crisis here in Northern Ireland. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's, that, that's, we're holding on to that hope. Because outside of that, we, um, we there's nothing else we can do. Because at the moment, even if it, even if there was a government in Stormont, and even if there was a vote taken, which there will be if Stormont gets up and running, it it, it is on the agenda. The uh, the DUP have a petition of concern, and that petition of concern. Uh, means that if they have 30 signatures uh, from, you know, um, within one section of the community, say, for example, the, the DUP um, uh, unionists, they can block legislation. Um, right. So right. It, c- it could be blocked, um, like when we uh, put, we worked with the MLAs uh, um, at Stormont to close Mary Stopes uh, when they opened here five years ago. And we had all we had all the petitions, we had all the groundwork done, we had pressure on, and we actually won the vote in Stormont to close it. But Sinn Féin put forward a petition of concern, and that blocked that uh, legislation. So there is a, me- a mechanism still in place at Stormont um, if we have that vote. If it wasn't going our way and they were concerned about it, they would immediately put forward. 30 signatures from within the unionist community that would block that. So that is our safeguard at this point in time. But we are at the moment still at the mercy of Westminster because they still, um, without a, without a, uh, an act of government, uh, they they could impose it if they choose. So hopefully Theresa May uh, acts prudent and, and, and doesn't. Uh, railroad over the democratic process here because it would cause. I, I, I'm using that word constitutional crisis. I would. I, I'd like to say it would. Um, right. So we're we're lobbying the the DUP. Um, we're trying to get as many people to to contact them and, and get the assurance that they will um, hold back any legislation and work um, and lobby within Westminster to stop that from being a reality. So. I was in Ireland for a couple of weeks, uh, as you know, and one of the things that stunned everybody about the referendum on Friday was the extent to which the pro-life culture that had existed only a few short years ago had collapsed. Are you concerned about the same thing in Northern Ireland, that there's actually a silent pro-choice majority that you have to contend with? Um, no, uh, the people in Northern Ireland are different than the people in the Republic of Ireland. Um, whether, you know, they say it's down to the fact that, you know, we've had the troubles, we've come through persecution uh, for years, and um, there's a different culture here. I mean, I've campaigned in, in the, the Republic of Ireland for years. I'm in the movement for 20 years and in and, and Precious Life here in the North. And... Whilst we campaign here daily, weekly, um, through you know engaging with the public, the street outreach, taking the images out there, talking to people about abortion, just the same as what yourselves do in America, there's a different response in the north. Now, if I was to change the, if I was to say to you, well, like let's compare, I'd say Northern Ireland's more pro-life. Um, our youth team, Youth for Life, uh, were active in the in the south there during the run up to the referendum. And they were very demoralised by the response of the people, um, as opposed to the response that they receive here on their summer road shows and then their weekly outreaches. Um, there's just a different culture here. Uh, whether it's that mixture of evangelical um, influence, um, there's more God-fearing people here to a certain extent. Right. You know, there's there's a stronger faith in the north. And that comes from the Catholic and Protestant religion. But then again, we meet the ordinary, everyday people on the street with no faith, um, secular, you know, groups of people who are absolutely pro-life. But it, it's like, you know, I've had people travel up here over the years to help with our campaigns from time to time during bigger events. And they would be amazed at the response when you're on the street talking to people, you know, engaging the public. So they there's a different there's a different culture here and because we we couldn't have a referendum anyway we don't have rights to a referendum but as you well know the questions in the referendum was yes and no um yeah and the media controlled everything um it was shocking to see um how few people voted no in comparison to the yes vote which was you know 60 percent 
um, that's shocking to think that that was, um, you know, the majority um, of people. But we didn't see that on the ground either, you know, when the canvas, there was pro-life canvas. I think everybody is still shocked beyond words. And the question, you know, I suppose everybody's saying, how did this happen? What uh, happens? Absolutely. I was on the ground for a couple of weeks. I went door to door. We talked to yeah. hundreds, if not thousands of people. And mm -hmm. there was no indication that, no. that there was that big of a pro-choice no. majority. None at all. No. None. Now we, um, some of my colleagues from um, Derry, that would be on the border of Donegal, you know, Derry, Letter, Kenny. Now Donegal was the only uh, county that voted no. Yeah. Now we had pers personal experience with that because I've been speaking at numerous events from last year and spoken uh, a number of venues in Donegal, and and, and my team from Derry, uh, the Precious Life team, were very actively involved. And um, there, uh, to me, the influence in, in the county of Donegal is very similar to the culture in the north because it's just north of, you know, you're just crossing the border slightly. Right. But, but it was a totally different response there than maybe was in, in the Dublin city. But at the same time, all the other counties were all very similar. They were coming up in the 60s. So it's like, it, it, was, it just doesn't make sense. There's something that doesn't add up. And what happens? And I know here, as to my knowledge, that there there is a a legal challenge underway um, to challenge the uh, the referendum. I don't have enough information on it. I just know that pe people are putting together their concerns. People who were involved in the the count, um, the counts at the different um, counting centres, um, are putting together their concerns with um, a lot of stuff that was happening that, that, that wasn't legitimate. So there's behind the scenes, there is a challenge um, being prepared to take uh, a court case. Now, beyond that, I don't have enough information on it. Some people are just talking about it, and I think it, it should be this week. Um, there's an application uh, for a court challenge against um, the referendum result in some, the results in some way. So um, I, don't, I, I haven't enough information on it. But I don't, th I, I don't think... People are not licking their wounds at the minute. They're just getting over. It was a blow to the pro-life movement, and they're just trying to sort of get their head, head around what happens and um, consider what their next move is, you know, to to the, either a court challenge that some people can take or it's get up, rush yourself down and get up out onto the streets and continue to be a voice, continue to challenge this culture. And um, it will take a lot of work to turn this around because, you know, BPAS, British Pregnancy Advisory Service, looks set to be coming into Ireland. So we could see um, abortion clinics set up here, centres set up here um, over the next um, six months or so. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed they purchased the domain name abortion.ie already. They have? Well, that doesn't surprise me. None of that surprises me because they're vultures waiting to kill. Um, but the pro-life movement in Ireland, I believe, is a very strong movement, and mm -hmm. they will regroup. Um, they won't take this line down. Um, you know, it's just a case of just getting uh, breathing space for this week. Um, there's a lot of hurt people. There's a lot of, you know, how did this happen? How can we, you know, what do we do next? But, you know, I have no doubt being part of the All Ireland movement that. I'll be in Dublin next week to meet with some of the, the leaders in the South because we want to learn um, how they feel because how they feel feel is how we um, um, win. How, how, how we need to learn from, from their failure, right. what worked for them and what didn't work for them. And we need to do something different here. We can't just copycat what happened down there. We need to be you know, more wiser. We need to be prudent and we need to know what we need to do will effectively stop um, legislation here but again as I said to you it could be completely out of our hands uh, because of Westminster imposes it which I hope and pray to God it doesn't um, and it won't be for the want of lobbying lobby campaigns that we have already been involved in for 20 years we do have the assurance of many MLAs here and M the 10 MPs that they will do everything within their power um, and they have been doing interviews they have been making it very clear that abortion should not be imposed. Um, Ian Paisley, I mean, you've heard tell of the, well, Ian Paisley, the, the, the founder of the Democratic Unionist Party, who is now deceased. His son is my um, MP. 
So I will be meeting with him this week. Um, he's in my, uh, I'm one of his constituents member. I'm in his constituency, so he is going to. Um, I, I will meet him this week, and he's a Westminster MP. So I hope to, you know, I hope to get uh, more reassurance from him, and just maybe an update of how serious this um, threat really is in terms of introducing an amendment into um, a bill on the violence against women or something. I can't remember the exact name of the bill. Yeah. So one of the things I found very interesting when I was uh, campaigning with Save the Eighth is there was a lot of of Catholics from Northern Ireland that drove up to to join the campaign and and, and to fight to keep abortion out of the Republic. And a lot of them actually told me that they have begun to vote for Protestant politicians for the first time in generations because those are the most pro-life ones. Is is, is that a more common theme you see with pro-life ones? It is. It has become more common. I've noticed it over the maybe the last ten years because the Catholic um, voters here, the nationalist Catholic voters, have become very disillusioned by the uh, the Sinn Fein, um, the arrogance of the Sinn Fein party, um, and also uh, the SDLP party, the Socialist Democratic and Labour Party for the North, um, because they haven't been shown um, strong pro-life leadership. So it's something here that's different in the north that people uh, are willing to cross the divide. They're willing to vote. You know that would be unheard of like 20 years ago because there was much, so much history and the troubles here where you know, you know, you had to fight to to be, to be respected if you were a Catholic, for example, and people didn't get good jobs in the past, and, and obviously we had the troubles and people were segregated. But now that scene, there's a healing being taken place. That even people who would never have considered voting for the Democratic Unionists, who are an evangelical Protestant party, who are very strong unionists and are very anti an all Ireland, um, are saying, well, we must vote, um, or we must give the vote to a party that's willing to uphold our values as Catholics. And I would personally say, at this point in time, the Democratic Unionist Party is more Catholic than the Catholic parties. Right. They're more representative of our um, our own culture, our views, and our faith. Um, I have voted for the Democratic Union's party uh, party for years, and I work very closely with them. And you know, there's no such thing as a, a dividing line. There's no such thing as you know conflict uh, in religion uh, when when it comes to the pro life issue. People will stand together against abortion um, from the different parts. And that's my new campaign that I'm launching this next week. And it's Together for Life. And what I want to do is go out to Christian uh, people from different religions. I want to go out to different areas and I want to ask them, that will they stand together for life? Will they campaign? Will they challenge their politicians um, to um, to continue to uphold uh, the, the values for life and, and the protection of the unborn? So I've been meeting with some evangelical uh, pastors and I'm hoping to really spearhead that ground campaign that we will um, get out and talk to people um, in a larger scale throughout the six counties here. And there's many people at this point in time contacting us. How can we help? We want to do something. So that's really where we're... It's not like the same as in the south of Ireland where you literally need it every single person to vote. Um, we just want people uh, to lift the phone. We want to get people pro, you know, activated in their communities. And then on July the seventh, we have our, the All Ireland Rally for Life, which takes place in, in Belfast this year. It's our turn to uh, to have the rally. So it's a an important time to bring the people from all over Ireland um, and to fire each other up to really get our fighting spirit back. I mean, Ireland's been known for the fighting Irish, and I don't believe the fighting Irish are about to to lay dead uh, on the battlefield. I really hope and, and pray, and I do believe that they will roll their sleeves up and get stuck in again and do everything uh, to save lives. And, and if that means it's a day-to-day battle by saving one child at a time, as, as has to happen all over the world where abortion is legal. People just have to say, well, I can only do what I can do today, but if I save one life, um, and then fight and work to to turn back this tragedy that happened um, on the 25th of uh, May. Bernadette, where can people follow your efforts in Ireland? Um, well, they can follow on the Precious Life page. Um, it's um, Precious Life uh, Facebook page. Um, we're on Twitter. 
um, and we are just like building up um, uh, better social media skills because now we know more important we know more than ever we need to be more social media savvy we're very um, street savvy in the sense that a lot of our efforts are active on the streets but now we're coming to the realization we need to increase social media I think uh, it is a battlefield as well as as, uh, as on the streets we can change hearts and minds so if anybody wants to to link up to like our page they can like the precious life page they can like youth for life which is our, our youth uh, page they can like personhood uh, we have a, a personhood begins at conception page and they can follow me bernadette smith um on uh, on facebook as well um i'm we're on there daily updating and we will be updating more so in the future um weeks ahead so we'll obviously ask people to continue to pray for us um that we can still be uh, the light and hope for the rest of the world uh, because uh, alongside uh, alongside malta uh we're two last remaining parts of the world of europe where abortion is uh, is illegal and that's why they're targeting uh, northern ireland at this point malta is next and they're probably still i think they are um challenging malta to a certain degree but they took ireland and they're out to take the six counties but we say not in our name um we will do everything to protect our, our unborn and please god we, we will succeed Ladies and gentlemen, that was a conversation with the Belfast-based pro-life activist Bernadette Smith giving us an update on what's going on in her country on the north side of the Irish border. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. We'll be keeping you up to date on what's going on in Ireland. And uh, this show was brought to you by Total Rentals. I hope you join us again next week. If anybody wants to look at our previous shows, go to thebridgehead.ca or check out the Bridgehead on SoundCloud, iTunes, or YouTube.